But generally, you know, when we try to plan our work, we have our annual planning, uh, where it's a big iterative process between um, setting our company objectives, you know, where do we want to be a year from now? Um, how does that get us to where we want to be a couple years from now? And then working in sort of a W framework uh, in order to make sure that we're operating both at like top level, top down, as well as bottoms up approach. Hey, everybody, and welcome to How We Scaled It for Design Teams, the show that explores the arduous journey of growing a successful design practice from zero to one. I'm your host, Adam Furless, the CEO and founder of Academy, a UX staffing and recruiting agency. And today we're going to be talking to Kevin Wong, the head of design at Webflow. We're going to be discussing a lot of different things, uh, including how to launch features and um, what it's like to do that at Webflow. So stay tuned for that. But before you do, if you could please like and subscribe to our YouTube and Spotify channels, it would really mean a lot. But without further ado, here's our conversation with Kevin Wall. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Really excited to be here and uh, to talk to you about how things work at Webflow. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, so Kevin, to give the audience a little bit of context, uh, could you kind of tell a little bit about your background and what you're up to now? Yeah, of course. Um, so, you know, going back a little bit about uh, my own career journey and, and uh, history, I actually started out um, as a researcher at a, a local Seattle boutique design firm called Artifact. Um, and, you know, the design firm was really similar to like IDEO and Frog or Method. Uh, and my job was really to develop insights and interaction prototypes for a lot of Fortune 500 companies. You know, think about Microsoft, Samsung, Hewlett Packard, and Huawei. Uh, it was a great opportunity and experience to get a wide range of, um, you know, look at design problems from different industries like healthcare, enterprise sales, and fintech, and and social and mobile computing. Um, and then, you know, from that point, I got really excited about what it meant to be in house. And so I had moved to San Francisco and uh, joined a Series B startup to be a UX lead. Uh, where I worked on uh, a commenting platform and social media content aggregation company um, and worked on some SaaS tooling and products and um, grew to lead the design team there. Uh, since then, I had joined a small startup um, and tried that out as employee number four. Um, and then uh, most uh, more recently had joined you know Airbnb for uh, a number of years, uh, leading the host um, part of the host team as well as our global support products team. Uh, where we were thinking a lot about the end-to-end -end support journey for guests and hosts. Uh, and I really love that experience because it was a chance to not only do product design, but also some service design uh, and lead some pretty big transformations um, to really redesign our policies, programs, and, and product UI. Uh, and then after that, I had a short stint at Messenger uh, and Meta, uh, where I worked on remote presence. Uh, and this was really interesting time period because, you know, during COVID, we were experiencing a lot of shelter in place, um, where I worked on a lot of the real-time communication tools for um, all the family products. So think about like Instagram, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, and Oculus. Uh, and then finally, it kind of leads us up to today where I'm now leading product design for Webflow. Uh, and this includes all of the product and content design work, design systems, and working really closely with our engineering and product leads. Uh, and so here we're just trying to help people bring super uh, bring web development superpowers to everybody, um, and we really want to help uh, folks build their websites, whether it's up and coming startups or global brands. So it's only been a year and a half, and I'm just loving it so far. That's that's awesome! Wow, you have an incredibly impressive background. It's so nice to hear about your journey uh, to this point. And you know, I think the focus of our conversation today, I'd love to talk a little bit about feature launches. You know, Webflow is pretty known for doing some pretty epic feature launches. And I think um, generally they're really well received. They're really well thought out, um, well marketed as well. Um, and, you know, the community um, is a very big part of, you know, how these features get developed. And I'd love to, to hear a little bit more about like the discovery process. How do you go about figuring out what features to build next? Um, also, like, how do you figure out like what are the things that may be broken in your platform today that you're like, oh, maybe that wasn't the right approach. We should try yeah. something else. Um, yeah, I'd love to start there. Yeah, there, there's so much there, and you know, I know every company has their own way of doing it. Um, so Webflow, you know, I, I think just in terms of how we 
figure out like what's on the roadmap and how do we plan the work that we have ahead of ourselves. And it's kind of aptly timed because we are in annual planning season. Um, so shout out to all companies and, and teams out there who are just in the thick of it. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's generally like three buckets of work that um, typically happen. So there's planned work, which we try to do, you know, around typical rhythms of the business. There's emergent work, you know, that's kind of based on like our learnings as we make progress on projects and initiatives. And then there's the unplanned work, stuff that, you know, it c- catches us by surprise or, or just happens to be an incident uh, or are things that are like bottoms up and teams get really excited. They see an opportunity and we find ways to make it onto the roadmap. Um, but generally, you know, when we try to plan our work, we have our annual planning uh, where it's a big iterative process between um, setting our company objectives, you know, where do we want to be a year from now? Um, how does that get us to where we want to be a couple of years from now? And then working in sort of a W framework uh, in order to make sure that we're operating both at like top level, top down, as well as bottoms up approach. Um, so the W framework is essentially we have um, executives and senior leadership set some high level company goals. You know, where do we want to be financially or where do we want to be with satisfaction? Um, and then uh, taking that general guidance, um, teams are then going to work within their own pods or pillars uh, to come up with a plan to say, here's how we think we can drive impact. Um, and that may be informed by some of the discovery work through user research or data science um, or just prior uh, insights that we've had just by working in the problem space for a long time um, and then using this as an opportunity to say, hey, now is the right time for us to prioritize it uh, and make you know inroads into launching either a product or, or iterating on some features. Uh, that goes back up to you know, senior executive review we tried to use that first touch point to really drive alignment. You know, like where are those dependencies between different teams? Do Are we touching the same surface? And should we be thinking, you know, more holistically so that we aren't, say, shipping the org chart? Uh, and then given that feedback, we'll do another rev uh, at the team level um, to really fine tune the, the plans. Um, also think a lot more about, you know, resourcing, staffing, um, and, and general sequencing of the work. Uh, and then that goes into one last review before we lock things in and then, uh, you know, just start uh, going off to the races. Um, so, so that's like setting the plan for the year. Uh, and then, of course, everything after that, like, <laughs> is bound to change um, probably the next, you know, couple of months. But, you know, we try our best to at least uh, have that moment to align and, and you know, recenter ourselves. Yeah, and I'd imagine, I mean, the way you describe it, it sounds like there are a lot of different groups involved. There's senior mm-hmm. leadership. Uh, I'd imagine there's a product management, um, user research, um, yeah. you know, also maybe even customer support um, mm-hmm. and, and uh, maybe some other groups I'm not even thinking about, but I guess your design team. Um, and how do you like collect all, I, there's a lot of information there, you know, like, millions probably of, of customer support tickets, um, you know, hundreds of maybe user interviews, um, you know, stakeholders uh, and leadership, you know, having their own POV of where the product should go. Um, yeah. All these things need to kind of be uh, synthesized and consolidated down and prioritized. How do you get there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's a lot of information. And you know, it, it's uh, that richness. It's both like it, it's wonderful because you have so much input and ways to inform your thinking. Uh, but yeah, it's a lot of work to be able to distill that into something that feels actionable and concise uh, and memorable. Because you want people to also understand where we're going and, and share that vision as a company. Um, you, we, we have a lot of different sources. Like we have our wish list. You know, this is. Uh, a place where the community submits ideas and they're able to upvote it. So that's one source of input for us to help um, identify those opportunities. Another is doing the research itself. So we may have prior to like annual planning, a sneaky suspicion about what big problems we want to be solving and what we think is going to really move the needle for us. 
Uh, and so the research team may start to do some of that uh, groundwork to understand and do the discovery. Um, and, and we have a great uh, user research organization that's both sort of a combination of uh, user research um, and uh, what we call decision science, um, which is, an, is another way of saying data science. So these combined give us a really rich qualitative and quantitative perspective. Um, and then, you know, I, I think there's like prior work that, you know, we have ideas about, you know, in previous years that we just weren't able to prioritize. Uh, and so we want to, you know, move that forward. And so I think that in terms of like, how do we even prioritize that? Like, how do we even set those strategic objectives? Um, you know, I, I think it is a series of conversations with senior leaders to understand, you know, overall, like what is the biggest impact that we can have, uh, both in terms of uh, the like satisfaction and adoption of Webflow, um, as well as I think l asking ourselves like which customers are we trying to also prioritize? Um, how much of the needs are coming from those who are in the agency background or and, and running their like studios and freelance um, businesses or how much of this is more focused on like teams uh, where they need more support for like collaboration and um, even things like better user roles and permissions. Um, and so I think we are able to apply some degree of uh, financial forecasting to say, here's how much value there is. Um, and then looking at it sort of holistically to say, okay, what's the composition of all of these different product opportunities? And what's sort of the right level of investment that we think we can make um, in order to, you know, land something really great um, at the level of, you know, execution that we think is important too uh, for this year or, or maybe next year. Uh, so it, it's also, it's very iterative. It, it does require a bit of, um, you know, clear storytelling from the top to say, you know, here, here's, what we're trying to achieve uh, and then also listening to our teams on the ground to say you know this is how much time it's going to you know take to work or, or here's an opportunity that we may need to also consider in order to fit within that overall narrative yeah it's it's definitely a, a balancing act it sounds like of you know kind of measuring those business goals with the user goals and also like just team capacity you know <laughs> like you guys totally. are only so big and you can only do so much work in a year. <laughs> you know, yeah. how do we, how do we get to that next feature launch where you're not overwhelmed or the team doesn't need to grow tremendously to be able yeah. to, um, you know, and not lose focus at the same time. So that's got to be done organically. Um, and so I, I had a question that I want before we like kind of move on to team growth, because I think that's part of this. Um, I had a question about like, Who's kind of responsible for synthesizing all this? I mean, is it a combination of people? Is there somebody who's like solely in charge of this? I mean, is it like the head of product? Is it the um, head of research? Um, right. Maybe it's you, the head of design. How do you like really solidify like where you land on this? Yeah. So I think that the plan that we are trying to align on and, and say, here, here's what we're going to, to do and here's what it's going to take. Um, is a combined effort between myself, our head of product, and our head of engineering. Uh, and so we work together with our um, team leaders to say, okay, let's bring everything together. Um, let's pull it all into uh, a single narrative and talk about, you know, what um, what the goals are and reiterating that like we have the shared sense of the uh, of the outcomes. Here are the projects that we're going to, um, invest in, here's the level of investment, uh, and then here's, you know, the, the outcome or what you can expect. Some of the additional like details that help us communicate what that plan is, uh, can come from different functions. So from design perspective, what really helps us is having either a set of prototypes or, uh, design mocks that help really visualize what the experience is that we are trying to achieve. Uh, these are all very gestural, you know, early on, somewhat fuzzy. Sometimes we can be a little bit more concrete uh, depending on how ambiguous the problem space, but we want to introduce these visuals in order to help anchor people on, you know, a potential future um, that that we are trying to strive for. From oh, that's a, interesting. Yeah. 
So yep. you you guys almost treat it like a, almost like an agency pitch where you're like, hey, like we have this general broad idea of a few different things that we're thinking about, you know, yeah. here's like high level, like kind of how that could look like very rough. It doesn't have to be a rough sketch, but it could be high yeah. fidelity, something to kind of demonstrate it. And then that will spark a conversation that could lead to it maybe getting prioritized or deprioritized. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I think the, it's interesting, like we, we want to be as informed as possible, right? Like everyone has their own ways of being more, uh, you know, eyes wide open to the situation. Cause, cause we are, like you said, making trade-off conversations, like, you know, how much can we really invest and what do we get for that investment, uh, of like time and, uh, and energy. Um, and you know, whether it's like, here's a, uh, impact analysis that's more data oriented or, you know, here's a tech spec or, or a technical spike that shows, you know, sort of an architecture diagram. I think all of these kind of play a role because I think every person in the room may have a different question uh, because they see, you know, different, uh, you know, like headwinds or tailwinds that we should be thinking about. So we, yeah, we are trying to be as rigorous as possible. And I think design's contributions are helping see things from the user's perspective, right? Like we're, we want to uh, empathize and model the end user experience so that, um, you know, I, I think the analogy is when you say like you're talking to your friend or partner, you're like, I want a dog. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And you're like, well, you know, do we have the same picture of what that dog is? Do we have the same vision of like, how our lives would change once we have a dog who's taking care of it. Uh, are they big, small? <laughs> you know, I, I, but I think these, uh, you know, these artifacts are really valuable because we, we can avoid some of the pitfalls that happens later on when you get into execution. Um, and they say, hey, that's not what we talked about. And, you know, that's where we get in trouble and, you know, things slow down or, you know, we, we ship something that actually isn't what we wanted. Right. And and along those lines, you know, once you've decided on, you know, a plan of action, like, hey, you know, the, or not a plan of action, but like the features that you plan on launching, you know, right. in a particular time period, what does that plan of action actually look like? You know, like, yeah. and, and how do you, how do you start implementing? What are the first steps? Yeah. So I think it involves having a really strong product brief. These briefs are documents, and we have somewhat of a of a written document culture that allows us to try to you know be concise and concrete about you know the really important um, you know talking points or, or or like you know parts of the strategy. So like clear articulation of the problem: who are we solving for? What is the value? How do we measure that? Um, and then what is the, you know, series of milestones that will help us understand we're, we're making progress towards that goal. Um, I think with that can be an accompaniment of like a Figma file, which may be, you know, those prototypes, uh, it may include, um, technical, uh, documentation, um, from a tech spike. Uh, and then from that point, there is a more of like a execution plan. Um, so we use, you know, different types of like. Uh, swim lane kind of tools that help us track like who's working on what, um, how much time we want to spend, you know, from ideation to uh, design. There's definitely going to be like some component of research in there to help us, uh, you know, evaluate the success of a design, you know, from a comprehension or usability standpoint. Um, and then when we plan to either do a, a beta or some, uh, when we plan to do a, a, uh, G GA launch. Um, the, and then I think from that point, we also, you know, review with our go to market team. And, and so go to market includes things like our, our marketing team, uh, sales, um, community support. And we want to make sure that we build in time and, and have those alignment meetings to, uh, make sure how we talk about the products and features to users and, and the community makes sense and would resonate. Also, any readiness and training that would help sales and community support ensure that once this thing, once this product lives or once the feature lives, um, you know, they're prepared for, you know, that customer interaction uh, whenever that happens. 
That's great. And and how do like the teams get organized? Like, do you have a design ops team that you work with that helps mm-hmm. kind of um, resource manage and assign you know quantity of people to a particular project or particular mm-hmm. types of resources to a project? How, how does all that work? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we uh, it's a it's a combination of the managers uh, and an operations team. So we do have a couple um, product uh, operations managers who are fantastic. Uh, so glad uh, we have them. So if, if you are listening, uh, so much love and appreciation. Uh, we, we also have a uh, design operations manager role that we just filled. So we're really excited to have this person join next year. Um, by and large, it's been like managers who are understanding the resourcing and timing and making sure the work is both allocated as well as we're um, aligning on, you know, the, the timing of when we want to achieve milestones um, for those really complex initiatives that may involve multiple teams um, because there's like a shared surface, then operation managers become really important to help communicate and organize that coordination. So for example, uh, when we were doing our localization work, uh, we had four um, work streams that were happening um, almost simultaneously. And it was really important that we would have both communication happening with uh, leadership because it was a top priority, but also with other teams because we were working within our CMS tool, uh, our designer, um, the design systems team. And so having just that constant communication uh, to ensure everyone was aware of what changes were happening, um, that any times that needed to uh, do reviews or you know get together to workshop ideas to make sure we were aligned on an implementation path, that would happen, mm-hmm. and it would happen in a timely way. That's really cool. And and like when when you guys do um, the actual work and get to the execution part of it, um, you know, do you guys work in a particular model? Like you know, of course, sir, you know. Design sprints were very popular for a little while. Um, there are various versions of that that I think have taken shape. Um, you know, multidisciplinary teams, et cetera. Like, how does that process work at Webflow? Yeah, and I think um, it's a good question. So we do some combination of design sprints and uh, workshopping with our partners. Um, and when I say partners, I say our engineering and product. Uh, internally, we call ourselves the EPD organization. So this represents, you know, the the technical team that's responsible for building products and features. And for us, we strongly believe in this trio or three-legged stool, if you will. Um, We've just found time and time again that having all three functional members together on a project from start to finish is so critical. Um, It's a really healthy collaboration that allows people to make sure we understand the viability, the feasibility, and the desirability of what they're working on. Um, and so we have a couple different rituals that help them collaborate. We have um, you know, product reviews that allow teams to work together, and then we can all get together and say, like, are we aligned on the direction? And um, are we asking all of the really hard questions um, and applying the right level of rigor? We also do design sprints um, occasionally to help accelerate uh, and rapidly develop ideas <clears throat> where we're constantly prototyping and designing either end-to-end flows or very specific interactions. And then we um, do a combination of sharing them via Loom um, or uh, posting them through Slack and, and doing our own design crits and design reviews. Loom has been really interesting because as a remote first company, a lot of the work is done asynchronously. And and also, you know, we want to provide a lot of visibility for a lot of different folks that are involved, especially with large initiatives. So uh, it's been really helpful for us to um, have these uh, rapid design um, weeks where they're almost like a new version of a prototype is shared um, maybe every other day or once a week. Uh, and then There's a lot of feedback that comes in um, from different folks and and they're able to then take that uh, and then make further iterations. And and so it's a function of getting alignment, but also like strengthening the idea. 
Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing to hear about like all the, all the steps that kind of go into building out one of these features. Um, and like, maybe you can walk us through some of the, you know, I know you guys made a lot of changes recently. You talked a little bit about localization. Um, hey. you know, can you share a few of the features that, you know, were, you know, recently built out and, you know, maybe like, I don't know, generally the timeline it takes to build one of these things. Yeah, so localization uh, was a very big endeavor that um, took about about a year to really like build. Um, there's a lot of technical underpinning that went into thinking about the architecture, scaling it, um, and also just like laying the foundation that would enable a lot of really cool functionality that um, we want to invest in next year. Um, I think that part of what uh, made localization an interesting feature to build uh, was figuring out like what is the right um, you know experience we wanted to create uh, as Webflow because uh, I think localization you, you got to figure out like what's the right set of features and requirements uh, where and how much of the translation management process do we you know consider you know trying to support ourselves uh, and what we quickly realized is we wanted to you know, really lean into our strengths as a visual development platform um, and, you know, enable translation and localization functionality that uh, would easily be, you know, rendered and viewable and uh, could be designed and customized uh, right there on the canvas. Um, so in terms of like the process, there was a lot of customer insight that happened um, early on. So uh, there's some concept work from design. We had talked to customers to help us uh, validate, you know, both the problems and expectations about, you know, where Webflow's responsibilities and, and um, you know, value would kind of like start and end. Um, and then from that point, uh, we started to do the actual design work of, you know, how to configure localization. Uh, we wanted to set a primary locale. We want, also want to help help you set um, n number of locales, so secondary, tertiary. Uh, then there's also the um, designing of the loca uh, of your site in that locale. Uh, so you know what's the right model in which you would toggle the view in which you would be designing in, say, French or in Japanese. Um, and so just getting that interaction model and that mental model right, and having that toggle in the top left was. Um, you know, an area of exploration, how you then like, you know, we Webflow has two different ways of how you can edit content and, and add content. There's the static content, which you directly add onto the canvas. And then there's the dynamic content, which is powered by our CMS. Uh, so there's, you know, two ways in which you could translate content, you know, very direct manipulation, as well as more of like from a data view. Uh, so exploring ways that we would handle that, but also make it feel intuitive to other UX patterns that are, uh, you know, existing today uh, within Webflow. Um, and then the, the fourth uh, big bucket was um, thinking through like the delivery of that content. And so SEO, opti like <clears throat> thinking about SEO uh, and making sure, you know, routing. So when you are setting um, the URL pathways, uh, we wanted to also think through that. So it was, it was a very involved process in terms of thinking through what are, what's the like vertical value or the end to end value when someone thinks about, you know, making the best possible experience of their website for a global audience. Um, and, and how someone who's building that site, you know, cares about search, the site experience itself, and, and also any sort of like personalization. Yeah. And, and I'm curious, like, um, how big is the design org at Webflow? How many people, you know, do you kind of supervise directly? Yeah. So the whole team, we have, um, 19, uh, designers and mm -hmm. that is across our product, um, organization, which, uh, we have, uh, seven pillars. Um, and then we have our, part of that is our design systems team. Um, and then we have content design. Uh, and we have a few managers uh, on the team um, who oversee some of the uh, the pillars. Um, and then 
we are intending to grow um, next year. So uh, once we start to finalize the plans exactly, uh, you know, excited to share more updates about, you know, uh, new roles that will uh, help us, you know, uh, achieve our goals as the as a design team. That's great. And yeah, I'd imagine, you know, when you launch these features, you start to think about, oh, which group does this affect and how do we resource yeah. and manage that connection? And as you said, sometimes you're working on, you know, something like localization, which may affect one team. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we actually, yeah. there's a whole slew of other issues that will come up with this that we need to engage another team and collaborate on. So yeah, uh, it's uh, you have one big happy family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, you know, localization was designed, I think, by and large by one designer. Um, she is incredible and uh, she has, you know, achieved something really impressive for the company. And and I think the the whole product was a huge success um, by by all of our metrics. Um, and yeah, we, we try to position every designer, you know, they're, they are embedded within their teams. They have a lot of autonomy and, and ownership and really they operate as a generalist. And so they do think about uh, both like, what is the strategic alignment to the company? What is the right product experience? And uh, how do we execute that and work with our engineers to ensure what's shipped is high quality? Um, and then we try to build in our own rituals as a design team to make sure that we don't have these like islands of work that are happening. So every, we have something that's like a, a design team biweekly stand up. Uh, and this is probably my most favorite meeting of um, of the month. So every other week we get together. It's about 30 minutes, 45 minutes long. Every designer will share one slide that represents a project or initiative that they're working on. And they have to give an update about, you know, what are they doing? What are they trying to focus on for the next couple of weeks? And visually, like, here's like the thing that I'm looking at day in and day out right now. Uh, and then it's just rapid fire. You go down the list of all the work that everyone's doing. Um, it's really great energy. And it's wonderful because it gives everyone a sense of all the design work that's happening at Webflow. And from that point, people can say, hey, that looks like something, uh, that looks like a problem that I'm also kind of thinking about. Or you, I see you're also working in um, the designer. And I also am playing around with a similar pattern, like we should talk. Uh, and that provides a really great, more organic way to bring people together, um, you know, think across boundaries <clears throat> uh, and yeah, start to make sure we are building a very cohesive experience that has that interoperability in mind. And we are trying to also just simplify where we don't want to create so many new patterns that could be done with one, you know, approach uh, in many different ways. Yeah. And I think you bring up such a great point. You know, one of the, the things we've talked about in the past on this podcast is you know, building <laughs> culture and it's, it can be really hard to do that, especially in a remote environment and also in kind of like a, I don't want to say siloed, but I'm going to use it for now, like yeah. siloed teams, right? Teams that are focusing exclusively on a particular pillar that those um, individuals within those teams can sometimes feel alienated because they don't mm -hmm. get to collaborate with so many other people on the team. Maybe they, in some cases, they may have not even met them in person before. Um, so it sounds like actually this is a really great design ritual that allows your team to showcase both their personality, their work, their skill, and collaborate with other team members um, in some way. Uh, to kind of build that camaraderie and build that culture. So I think that's actually a really wonderful takeaway of, um, you know, the way that, you know, your process works and, and, um, and how you guys think about launching new features. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think about that a lot too. And I think it's been, you know, I think we've all experienced a lot of challenges and how we can bring teams together, especially when we're remote and we don't have that face-to-face -face time. Sometimes it does feel like, it's a there's a barrier or a high bar to uh, to reach with like even scheduling what is intended to be a casual or informal uh, get together. Um, like, hey, let's get coffee. Oh, I gotta add this like you know thirty minute hold on your calendar. Like, oh, that sounds so formal. Um, but you know, I I think we're we're trying to experiment with different ways to yeah have that 
um, unstructured time. And I think it does uh, require some planning just to make sure that we are uh, making that space available. And especially as, as a leader and as a leadership team, it's thinking about incorporating that into the day-to-day uh, and, and still having fun because we do spend so much time together and you know we want to make the work enjoyable too. And because I think that enjoyment and fun does find its way into the work itself. Um, and so that's uh, a very important aspect that you know, as a constant topic of conversation, um, you know, we've tried things like brown bags and uh, Friday like jam sessions. And so I, I think we're learning a lot more about how we want to iterate and evolve it. And I think it is mostly a reflection of where your team's at. Um, and I think we all have a vision of what we all want to eventually get to. Um, it's just a matter of finding those steps to to get there. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, we talked a little bit about all these successful features that you guys have launched. I'm curious, you know, what are the times where maybe something either has not been successful or maybe you, you, you tried one approach at first and then when you actually brought it into like user testing, you know, people are like, uh, that's not how I envisioned it. Um, <laughs> you know, can you share any of those kind of uh, war stories? Yeah, I mean, I'll share one from a different company. <clears throat> so I'll share one from a different company. And uh, this was during my time at Messenger. We, you know, we're working on calling and and calling, the act of calling is a very, um, you know, direct and uh, sometimes can be seen as like a serious uh, step to take. You know, it's usually reserved for someone that you, are really close with or is about a situation that is like, hey, I, I really want to talk to you about something like synchronously. It's not something you can do over text. Um, and we were working on some features and updating some of the treatment to the entry points of like how one could initiate a call. Uh, the, the treatment itself was successful in some ways, uh, but it ended up also triggering some accidental calls, un- unintended accidental calls. And I, I think doing so, especially for a person who may not fit that like uh, bucket of, I want to call them, I, I always call them, um, is, is sort of alarming uh, for both like the, the caller and the, the recipient. Um, and, and so I think through the experimentation, we, we quickly realized um, this was not the right approach and we really needed to, you know, revert back to, um, the previous treatment. Uh, and, and I think that was a really good lesson in, in terms of, you know, thinking about what the, um, h- how to be very careful, uh, about certain actions that can trigger, you know, really, uh, scary situations. Um, And I think that's why we have these experimentation frameworks and and approaches in place to help us uh, quickly understand these um, incidents, uh, situations before, you know, we scale them, especially to uh, the size that um, Meta is. Uh, And so that was a really key learning. Um, Also, I think that, you know, it's it's funny, in, in some respects, you could say it was a success in terms of we were initiating more calls, uh, which was, you know, can be considered a, a, a positive metric. But then you also need to have these like guardrail metrics, which is, well, how, how long was that call? Um, how do you measure intentionality? And, you know, I think it's within, you know, a second of initiation does the call end. And so you, that's also a metric that we would want to pay attention to. Yeah, I, I love that. And I'd imagine Webflow, you guys have a process also for testing and you know the research component of this you know when you guys do launch a new feature I mean, does it yeah. start in prototyping and doing some like you know quantitative or qualitative testing there and then move into maybe like a beta program i know you guys often have people opt in for things like that where they get like a feature release in advance um yeah. how's all that work yeah uh all the above um so so i not every project follows the same formula or or set of you know practices um but yes we do do uh research um both to inform requirements but also to evaluate uh the um 
the effectiveness of a design. And so there could be a series of like tests to do task completion or general interviewing to gauge comprehension. Um, you know, does the person wayfind correctly? Is the nom- is the, the the content design? Does it make sense? Um, and then we also do uh, we have what we call release planning. So release planning allows us to gate um, feature rollouts so that we are constantly evaluating um, you know the the stability and reliability uh, and also the quality of the the shipped product experience. So we do alphas, which are you know released to internal folks. Um, everyone can you know use uh, the feature that's being developed uh, by turning on a feature flag, and then we do have betas, which uh, depending on the complexity of the project, uh, people can um, join and opt in. We use internal communication tools to uh, work with participants to solicit feedback, and that feedback goes directly to the team so that they can. Uh, make iterations, whether it's fixing bugs or taking a look at some of the prior design decisions. Um, and then after the public beta, uh, it goes into to GA. Um, and then even with a GA, we are always listening um, to our customers to say, to hear, you know, what's working, what's not. Um, and sometimes they'll, you know, get trickled through our support team. Um, sometimes we'll catch them through social media posts, uh, but they all sort of funnel into something that we call UX paper cuts. And these UX paper cuts are a way to track not like serious bugs, but maybe annoyances or like weird situations that just don't feel right ergonomically or add just a little bit too much friction that is annoying. Um, And so we try to track those you know, ins- instances too, and we'll we'll log that, and then we'll tag people, and um, you know, part of our own internal process is looking for opportunities to um, resolve those paper cuts. Uh, so we may not get to all of them right away, but it is something that we want to at least monitor, um, and then start to you know find ways in our own development process, whether they're you know um, sprints of like paying down those paper cuts or just building time into our roadmap uh, to make sure we're just kind of like gradually uh, chipping away at it over time. That's great. Uh, This is amazing. It's so nice to hear, you know, about the entirety of, you know, the process that you guys go through at, you know, a company like Webflow um, where, you know, you really take these features very seriously. Of course, they have huge impacts for your business, you know, from start to finish. Um, so I wanted to thank you for walking us through that and uh, definitely a lot of really great takeaways here. Um, before we go, I wanted to see, is there anything you'd like to share, you know, with our audience, maybe, um, upcoming things that you're able to share that you're working on or, um, anything else you'd like to promote? Yeah, gosh. Um, we, I'm so excited, uh, to, um, have launched Webflow apps. Uh, so our ecosystem, um, we allow developers to build third-party experiences. Uh, so you know, if you are using Webflow and um, there's a feature that seems to be missing, and uh, or there's a, a way to make your site better, um, you know, you can either look for the app uh, in our marketplace, or if you're a developer, um, you can build these apps for other designers. Uh, so definitely check that out. Um, and then we also, you know, released our new brand and a new product uh, design. Um, and so we're really excited about this rollout. Um, we think that it really helps us uh, articulate and and just um, sort of share to the rest of the community and the world. Like, you know, we're here as a professional tool to help you um, build your next website. Again, whether you're a startup or uh, a global brand or uh, enterprise. Um, and we have uh, a lot of power uh, and a lot of uh, features that we hope you'd uh, come check out, explore. Um, and then we are uh, you know, excited about next year. Um, our goal is to uh, grow the team. Um, so please keep an eye out uh, for career opportunities. Uh, we'd love to chat. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for uh, hanging with us today, Kevin. I really appreciate it. And um, have a wonderful rest of your holiday week and um, happy new year to you. Awesome. Happy new year. Thank you, Adam. Thank you.